over 800 wonderful people out there that are listening to us. Actually, not all of you are listening, but you are on the page. So tell your friends, listen to one of the podcasts. Uh, we're talking, what are we talking about this week, Ashley? Uh, we're in, uh, let's see, We're Exodus, still in Exodus, yep. And we're in Matthew, of course, Proverbs and, and uh, Psalms. Psalms. Yep. So uh, anything stick out with you this week? It was a very interesting week. I actually posted on our Flourish page on Facebook it was arduous in the sense that we were going through the laws yes. you know, pertaining to Mount Sinai mm-hmm. and the tabernacle and so forth. In fact, the tabernacle, we need to talk about that too. That's That was a part of... I know. Uh, I think there's a lot to cover this week. <clears throat> um, really, well, jump in. What do you have? Do you have anything? Well, uh, we start, um, I think we start with Moses and uh, the battle where Joshua goes to fight in the battle and they raise his arms and as his arms are raised... We did. That's where we started. <laughs> you look puzzled. <laughs> that is. That's where we have, started. Yeah, I missed that. Day it, or yeah, it was kind of in. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, okay, so right so he yeah the lifting of the hands. Yeah, the lifting of the hands. Aaron and, and her. A, yeah, and so they had to come was, and was raise her. Was her and him though? That's that's what I want to know. Her and him. Her. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um. Anyways, that's where we jumped in, and I just think the first kind of question i had is what's the current application or prophetic picture for for our current times with that kind of symbolic of the battle that's happening and then moses he had this thing where if i raise my staff up in the air that they'll win and then his arms got tired so they gave him a place to sit and then he had two people come and kind of lift his arms yeah that's interesting It'd be interesting to hear what people think about yeah. that uh be sure to post and uh, get in touch with us. But I, I think, you know, traditionally it's been kind of interpreted as surrender. You know, it's it's like you're you're doing the opposite of what you normally do in a battle. Obviously, they were battling down Old Testament style yeah. down in the valley. And Moses is up on the mountain, and he is in a high place, and he's lifting his hands up, his yeah. staff up. So it's a sign of surrender. And when his hands got weak and weary. So that the full surrender of trusting God in the midst of battle, mm-hmm. when the you get weary of, let's put it in today's culture, it's 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 hard to follow Christ right now. Yeah, in the midst of a decaying culture, that is that the what the Bible would call a wicked and perverse generation. Mm-hmm. So we have that going on right now, <clears throat> particularly in America, and from what I hear around the world. So it's an encouragement to stand firm. To and I think the friends that are around you. Find the people that will lift you up in the midst of the challenge. And even if you bring it down to the specific trauma in your life, you know, you're facing yeah. disease, you're facing a divorce, you're facing whatever, you know, you need a circle of friends. Uh, the Bible says that friends are few, but uh, we're, we're told to actually communicate and be with one another, lock arms with one another. Yeah, It's a picture of the community of the church and, uh, and the support of one another in the midst of the trials that we're going through. Yeah, I think it's it just was an interesting story in there in the beginning. And then we jump into Exodus 19 where Moses goes up and the Lord calls him from the mountain, which I was so excited to see that we were reading about this this week because I could talk about this for, for days. Then start talking. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, the interesting thing I think was that he was, um, the go between, between God and the people. So he was like the communicator and I I thought it's interesting. Like the Lord didn't just communicate generally with everybody. He communicated to one person and then relied on Moses to kind of communicate his message. And I just think what trust he had in Moses to be kind of given that task yeah. Of communicating on behalf of the Lord. Yeah. Especially when you remember his complaint was from the beginning, I can't talk. Yes. I can't, you know. So here he's entrusting. It's such a picture really today. of We tend uh, to favor people in church life that are outgoing and obviously gifted. And sometimes they can be the most challenging people. Yeah. You know, but the humble ones that are behind the scenes, you know, I, I can't do that. I don't know. You know, I, I'm not really talented. Those people need development yeah. to come out of that. But that's kind of a better field to uh, to harvest out of, really. Yeah. And look for those people. And in that, you're going to find these amazing gems. So the Lord trusting Moses, they're probably, you know, 
I'm sure there was many other people he could select. Totally. That were, you know, Joshua was actually younger, but he was a great choice later on. Yeah. So there were other people that could have filled that role, but it's something about the humility of Moses and and his skills. And I, I would argue even the skills he had of being raised in Pharaoh's household. Yeah. He had a unique training, yeah. you know, <clears throat> that he doesn't promo. You don't hear him saying, hey, I was raised in Pharaoh's household. I used to be like yeah. a son. You know, I got the best training in Egypt. <laughs> Technically, the be- best training in the world. I could build an empire, you know. Yeah. He didn't do all that. He just, he went out under the, into the wilderness. He walked with sheep. Yeah. You know, which seems to be a traditional he was thing. Humbled. Yeah. A lot of David walked with sheep. A lot yeah. of them walked with sheep, you know, and they just had humble, quiet lives and God plucked them out of those quiet lives. Yeah. I just, um, I just think it's interesting. Like, did Moses know when he said yes to the Lord that this is what he was going to say yes to? <clears throat> You know, I know when he said yes to the Lord, he knew that he was going to lead people out of out of Egypt. But did he know that that in saying yes, it would lead him to having these, I mean, kind of epic encounters with the Lord and kind of communicating with the Lord in a way no one else had and no one else would again. And so, like, if we go verse by verse, I could go Don't verse. Don't you think it's a little like a marriage, though? I mean, you, you yeah. say... You know, yes, the day you of, don't know what you're I saying do, yes, 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 I do, I do, I do, I will, I yes. will, I will. <laughs> and you never, you know, you're not, you're, you're zoned out. You're probably not, you're looking in the face of the person you're going to be living with the rest of your mm-hmm. life. And, you know, you don't encounter, you don't think that, hey, we're going to have children. And, uh, yeah. And some of those are going to be difficult to work with. And, uh, <laughs> and we're going to have pay school bills. You wouldn't bills know what and, that's like, right? Of course, yes. Uh, yeah, well, no, <laughs> another another episode. Anyway, uh, you know, yet all those things that unfold in life, you have to say yes over and over again. Yeah. You know, if you've made a vow, you're, you re-up all the time. You're saying, and I'm sure Moses had to say, you know, because remember, <clears throat> Moses talks, if I remember this right, where God wanted to, wipe off you know start with a new a new group yeah we'll wipe them out start with a new group and moses basically becomes the uh, The advocate for them yeah and says no no you know well let's work this out let's you know he says the nations will say that you raised up this people and then you wiped them out you know so he he convinces god to, to back off on that so moses is way beyond where he ever thought he would be oh i'm sure he was I, you know, and you go into verse 19 and it says, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. And then it keeps going on where I I think it's, they go into this thing where he wants them to like um, wash their garments and get clean for three days, which I think is obviously symbolic because of the three days. And, Mm -hmm. and then on the third day, the Lord will come down upon the mountain in the sight of all the people. What do you, what do you, <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> he would come down the mountain. <laughs> I just, I think cause when I read it, I, it's almost like I can picture myself there. I put myself in their shoes. Like I think of myself living in a desert or living at the bottom of a mountain. And it's saying that the Lord came down like what? was that like to be there to see the Lord come down on the mountain? He would come in the sight of all the people. And he said, you shall set bounds for the people around saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. So he kind of set a boundary line. Not even a cow. Not even an animal <laughs> can go past. Touches it, Whoever touches dead. it will be put to death. Right. No hand shall touch him or he'll be stoned or shot with an arrow. Um, whether man or beast, he shall not live. And then when the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near to the mountain. Like, well, think, <laughs> think of, I'm thinking of transfiguration. You know, we're not there yes, yet. Yes, the thick cloud. But I thought, you know, the cloud came, He, the, the Lord was raised up. The cloud came down. The disciples saw it. And so <clears throat> I think that, I don't know if this was a greater intensity in uh, Exodus or what, but, you know, this this happens again, but you know, this ascending kind of yeah. a deal. And so you're wondering as the Lord came down, was it like the Holy spirit when he came on the day of Pentecost, 
and he came in. There was a whirlwind that was going on. I mean, if we were yeah. writing a movie on this, we could have a lot of fun, you know. Oh, I know. So it's it's amazing. And also, I think of him when he came off the mountain. And his face was glowing. His face was glowing. <laughs> he comes off the mountain, though. And, you know, he's coming off. There's, like, let's say, a million people. It's got to be a pretty heady thing when you've just been with God. You know, you're, you, yes. You, it's God and I. We're like this, you know. Yeah. And uh, we're coming off the mountain. And then to see what happened while they were up on the mountain. But you know what you know what I'd like to I I would like to just lift up another level. We can come back to this, but if we go up another level and look at there's a there's a narrative emerging here of people afraid to be near God. Yeah. So we've gone from walking with Adam in the garden to now people crying out, just don't let him come near. Don't please keep him back, you know. Moses, let him talk to you and then you can tell us what he said. So there was great dread with what God spoke. Yeah. The dread may have been like it scared him half to death. Like, well, I think was it was it? the thunderings, the lightnings, the yeah, so, fire. Exactly. And in Exodus 19 <laughs> deals with that. And that, yeah. that is what I had some notes on, actually. The thunder, the lightning, the thick cloud, the trumpet sounds, and the camp, it said, trembled. Yes. Now, <clears throat> immediately I thought, wait a minute. Okay, that's that's in Hebrews 13. So in Hebrews 13, going over in the New Testament, Paul, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, we think it probably was Paul, in a more matured state, at least the uh, the Greek is at a higher level in Hebrews than it is in the other books of the New Testament. And uh, he writes basically the exact same words out of the Torah, out of that passage, out of Exodus 19, and he says, you've, come to, you've not come to a mountain, basically, where thunder, lightning, thick cloud, trumpet sounds, camp trip, so that's he says, what the, what you read in the Old Testament is not what you're coming to now in Christ. Yeah. He says, but you are coming to Mount Zion. And then he goes into this litany of explanation of what it's like in the community of the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, you read it and you're like, well, where's that church? I want to go there. You know, I mean, it talks about the joyful assembly of angels and mm. and those who have been washed in the blood, the blood that is better than the, the blood of Abel. You know, it, it, it has this low, look at it in Hebrews 12. It's pretty amazing. And so I see this right now developing that this is a picture. This is a lesson to us as we read in the Old Testament. This is what Jesus did for us. Yeah. We could still be trembling in his presence <laughs> yeah. every time we approach him or not mm -hmm. even wanting to approach him, wanting to have a priest that you go to. And in the Catholic church, this is demonstrated in some ways. You go to a priest because there's a mediator and I, I don't have to encounter. I can tell you, you tell God you know, because you're a holy man. And we know now that you do not need that priest. I appreciate the activation they do in the Catholic Church, but now we can go directly to God. Yeah. And in Hebrews, it also says that we, you know, we go in with boldness. Yeah. So they've gone from dread in the Old Testament with Moses yeah. to boldness in the New Testament with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I think that's why it's good, though, to read through the Old Testament and you know, I feel like a lot of people kind of, you know, well, we're in the new covenant, so let's focus on the new covenant. And they miss things in the Old Testament because, you know, even though we're under a new covenant and we can approach his throne boldly, I think it's important to know the history of where we've come from so that while we can approach his throne boldly, we can also approach it with the understanding of the fear and trembling that he's still God. <laughs> you know, like we're yeah, not... The God of the Old Testament is the That's same still jesus yes <laughs> yes well, that yeah. he's still the same there is i think that sometimes i think in our culture and and in a lot of church cultures right now that we're really on the um jesus is our I, homeboy. our homeboy kind of you know <laughs> like is that one always come like, to me no but there's so much freedom and there's so much like what there's about all the grace for everything and ragged jeans on, on stage. Yeah. Is that, yeah. <laughs> but i just i, I think that there's I, I've learned in reading scripture, I think, and in, in, in this moment I've had with the Lord is how important it is to understand the fear and trembling and yes. and, and the fear of the Lord, because I think you can't fully understand your freedom and and what we have currently if you don't understand where we've come from. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, you yeah, can't absolutely. You can't fully appreciate that we can boldly approach his throne until you understand who mm. who he is and whose throne we're approaching. And I think when you read scripture and you read here in um, Exodus 19 and it talks about the Lord coming down and the thundering and the lightning, like if you actually put yourself in that position and you think what that must have been like, 
to encounter the Lord like that, it gives you kind of an infusion or an understanding of his his grandness. Yeah, which which will be witnessed. I mean, shoot, we I think we experience it in micro ways throughout our lifetime. Yeah. <clears throat> micro ways, not ways. Microwaves. microwaves. <laughs> Throughout our lifetime, we have this moment where you encounter God, you know, yeah. at church or, you know, friends, or today we're just chatting and you seem to have an encounter uh, uh, oh, before we did the podcast. The and <laughs> it's a moment where you're, you're sensing and feel something. And it reminds me also, which I mentioned a few podcasts back, John, the, the dear friend of Jesus, when he sees Jesus in his resurrected state yeah. after ascending, uh, in Revelation, he falls like a dead man. Yeah. So, okay, well, we're back to that God again, you yeah. know, but but it's like the protection of Christ in us that emboldens us. I mean, the physical body still on earth when God shows up in power is not able to contain it. Yeah. So that's that's that side of God, and that is all a part of God. Yeah, and I think I, I think the having the fear of the Lord be the lens in which you approach your relationship with him i'd not in a you know a mean god kind of way but in a in a genuine awe and fear of the lord a holy holy awe is what the passion translation kind of says when it talks about the fear of the lord is holy awe and i just think it changes how you view life it changes how you approach your life and i think you were talking on sunday about how it changes kind of the way that you um kind of build your life in the sense of your thoughts and your thought life and change those idiosyncrasies you mentioned about yourself that you start, Mm. it it kind of puts a magnifying glass on your life and you see, Oh, this area where I, you know, I don't know what example to use, like, Oh, where I've noticed that I swear a lot. And well, no, (laughs) no, I'm saying this is an example. This is a confession time. it's not a con- this is not a confessional. Um, but but things like that where you see these little things that you may not notice that when you start viewing your life under the lens of the fear and the holy awe of the Lord, yeah, you attitudes. start seeing, I don't need this anymore. Right. This is meaningless. Like, for example, when I started reading the word and I started encountering the Lord, the first thing to fall away was watching TV, which I watch TV. Is that a sin? No, no, it's not a sin. But it, I realized that I was spending more time with that than I was investing in my relationship with the Lord. Uh, yeah, and again... It gets your priorities in order. God <laughs> God has a path of holiness for every person. Yeah. And there are clear things that you should not do. I mean, yes. it's going to lead you... This The wages of sin is death. In my opinion, still... The wages of sin is death. Yeah. I mean, you may go to heaven, you're going to have eternal life, but boy, you're going to have hell on earth yeah. because you lived a life that was not pleasing to the Lord. Right. And we could argue whether you can lose your salvation or you walk away from Christ, what that looks like. But let's face it, in our daily lives, we we drift and we have to keep our focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hey, I know we don't have a lot That's of time. That's a tangent, sorry. I do want to talk about <laughs> seemingly chapters this week of do this, don't do that. When you do that, make sure you do this and, uh-huh. and back and forth. I mean, <clears throat> a couple of them that came to my mind is you, if your neighbor watches your money for you, you know, you put it in his safe and, and then it gets, you go out of town, you come back and it's not there. And you're like, hey, what happened? Oh, someone must have stolen it. And, you know, you try to find it. If there's no evidence anyone stole it, that you... <laughs> Bring the man before the Lord, the owner, who your neighbor who had this money. It's like you bring him before the Lord for like a a cat scan. Yeah, <laughs> and this cat scan is going to say whether he stole the money or not, and then you deal with it according to whether he's guilty or not guilty. I mean, can you imagine having to go before the Lord in this in this period where they're trembling before God? And did you or did you not steal the money that I gave you? Oh, my gosh. So it's the law is so detailed. I mean, where it said that, look, if you're if you uh, come into how is it? If you come into slavery single and then you you get married when you leave. I may get this mixed up here. Yes. Married when you leave that that you are both free. But if you come in. No, it's the other yeah, way no, around. Yeah, no, no. It's if you, you get married, you're married while you're a slave. Yeah, while you're a slave, then your wife is their <clears throat> property, and if you leave, she has to stay behind. And the children. And the children. But you can come <laughs> back out of freedom. Yep. 
go to your owner and ask him if you can be a slave again. This is a pretty specific thing. I mean, they're very detailed. Be a slave again, and the owner will make a determination. You become a slave again, but he puts an all, mm. A-W-L and all, yeah, in your in ear, ear, and that means you're basically a slave for life. And some people are now using that as a comparison of, of your dedication to Christ, because in Romans, we are called slaves. Yeah. We were slaves to sins. Now we're slaves to Christ. And so you look, this is a great example that you are outside into the freedom, but you, will you choose? I don't know if this is, you know, I don't want to say this is a different level of Christianity. It's definitely a different level of commitment where you say, you know what? I want, I want Lord, I'm not only following you, I'm your slave. Yeah. I do loss is the Greek word. I'm your slave. I follow you. I'm following you the rest of my life, like a marriage commitment. I mean, I think that's a that's a worthy altar call sometimes yeah. and say, you know, get the all in your ear. Yeah. And uh and and tell Jesus uh, nobody do that out there. I don't know how no, dangerous don't. Please, that is. Please, but we do not <clears throat> this is symbolic right that now. But you, you it's do. a commitment that you're making to Christ. And so I like that deeper commitment. I think yeah. Jesus <laughs> Yeah, here we go. We got a song, You're My All. <laughs> You are my all <laughs> <A-W-L>. in all. <laughs> yeah, so all these details. What do you think about these details, and why is that important for a Christian today in the 21st century to read that? I'm sorry, could you say <laughs> Are you paying attention to what I'm saying? <laughs> I am. Could you say Why that today, why? Uh-huh. with all the do this, don't do that, make sure mm-hmm. when you do it, why, why read that today? Shouldn't we skip over all that? Because we're in Jesus now. We don't have to worry about all that. Is it, do you think, for an understanding of... Like I said, where you kind of come from and that you can understand more of the freedom we have in Christ now that we don't have to do all these things that he, you know, you said earlier when we were talking before we started recording that, um, you know, there were all these commandments and now there's two. Yeah, with there was, Jesus, yeah well, through we, Jesus. of course, we know out of the Torah became yeah. the Talmud, which was the the priest's interpretation, <clears throat> the extra, the the. <laughs> what would you call it? The voluminous expansion of the 10 commandments into the how to's ended up being 613 laws in the Talmud. And when you read those, and I have, when you read them, it's exhaustive. So so you see in the time of Christ where they've had hundreds of years, this being hammered into them and the Pharisees are the experts on it. They're not following it. Of course, of course not. And Jesus knew that, Yeah, but they're commanding. They're watching everyone else. Hey, Hey, what are you doing? Hey, get, hey, what are you touching there? A control freak. Don't you know it's the Sabbath coming up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they were constant. They were just, it was the law coming, law, it was a weaponization of the law. The oppression to of the law. oppress yeah. good people. And Jesus, so they challenged Jesus. Actually, in Matthew, which we were reading this week, Matthew 24, 25 and all that, <clears throat> they challenged Jesus like, which is the greatest of the laws, you know? Yeah. And it's like a trick question. They're trying to trick him up. And he says, the greatest are the two. The greatest commandments are, are these. Uh, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, mic drop. I mean, there's yeah. no, and they're standing there with the 613 and everyone's feeling the weight of that, you know? And they're like, oh, I'm going to that church. Two? I'm following that <laughs> yeah. guy, you know? And so yeah. today, because, so what it does, I think, is show you the weight that grace has it doesn't mean that we do whatever we want. It really doesn't. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about it too because I was reading like the Ten Commandments and I thought, well, when Jesus came, it didn't just null and void the, like the Ten Commandments, right? Like we still, these are things that we want to still attain to of not committing well, uh, murder. Well, the two commandments and, that he gives arguably sums up the Ten Commandments. Yes. And actually <clears throat> sums well, up the 613 because if you love God, then with do, all your it's like soul. God saying, do I need to list what it looks like Yeah, to love God? Do I need to list what yeah. it looks like when you love mankind? And love is a big thing right now, you know, with, with all the things going out in culture, you know, you just need to love like Jesus. And, and I think, really? You know, I, I think mentioned I'm, this about I three think or four. my mind is being... <laughs> I feel my mind blown right now. Yeah, I've so, never thought about the fact that his two commandments sums up those ten. But when yes. you when you, I it's, why have it's I never believed to be five and that? five? The first one, there's five about God, there's five about Is that common knowledge? Am I just learning this six. for the first time? I think it's more four and six, but anyway, you can look it up and figure it out. But yeah, no, he that's how smart Jesus is. I mean, he's summing wow. it up. And see, they can't refute him. They're like, uh, 
with that there's kind of the yeah, but way maybe you're shifting things here. And what he's doing is he's taking the six hundred and thirteen and <clears throat> boiling it down to simplicity. Wow. He's decluttering the gospel. Yeah. He's saying the gospel is about you loving God and allowing that love. It's the cross. It's a minimalist the vertical kind of horizontal. Yeah. Yeah. Love wow. one another. And if you truly love one another, are you gonna steal their stuff? If you truly love one another, you're gonna bring bear witness, false witness against are you your gonna neighbor. commit murder. If you, you gonna... be- really love your neighbor, do you have relations with his wife? I mean, this is like it, you know what's like? It's like you've traded the Pharisees in for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because <clears throat> he's your helper now. Yeah. So now you struggle with sin. You're struggling with sin. You, The Holy Spirit's there to remind you you've been forgiven. And not only have you been forgiven, you you have the will and the power that, that sin will not be your master. That's different. In the Old Testament, sin was mastering them. I mean, they were, they were you know, and mm-hmm. they knew it. The worst thing about the, I mean, I love the law, but the law actually reveals how much you sin. Oh, totally. And you walk around totally condemned. They're already slaves, totally condemned, totally, totally confused. And then Jesus happily comes along in Matthew and says, oh, yeah, it's really, don't, don't sweat it. It's, it's yeah. love God and love people. Yeah. You do that, you're going to be okay. I do think that people do take liberties a little too far with it and in, in kind of, I'll call it grace culture, you know, where, oh, if you sin, it's fine. We it's covered. Grace. It's covered under the blood. And it's like, but then it, it almost, that becomes like, if I sin, then, well, it's fine. It's covered under the blood. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like there's a, it's kind of like a very narrow, uh, narrow road, I'll say very very tight rope that you're walking where you could you can take it to a real extreme and kind of abuse the grace if that makes sense uh, paul mentions this in uh, galatians where he says you know you do not use this as an opportunity to sin like, yes. like you, he's they're giving so much grace in the grace <laughs> you know they're saying this is how you operate grace <clears throat> you know you're going to stumble you're going to fall you, you have an advocate in Christ, you know, seek forgiveness, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. So a community of grace is like that. Yes, we, we, we sin periodically. Yeah. We have bad attitudes, thoughts, whatever it might be, actions, but we come to Christ and we know that, that he loves us and that he cares for us in the midst of that. So Jesus is unloading this huge burden that they are having and now making the walk with Christ much easier. It's interesting though, uh, throughout the, the Pauline epistles. And that's why there are sects, S-E-C-T, sects, mm-hmm. sects of Christianity mm-hmm. that uh, do not believe in the Pauline letters. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they do not include them because they say it doesn't align up with the grace that Jesus preached. Because Paul comes in, it was kind of like what I was preaching about Sunday about in Thessalonians, the mother and the father heart of God. Mm-hmm. There is a mothering aspect of God, the nurturing, kindness the care all that the father's side is is come on uh let's let's get up and let's move ahead you've got a you've got a mission mm-hmm. you've got a destiny in life so so the mother the motherly side of god is a secure identity secure in your identity in the father you'll see this in thessalonians uh two was it two yeah two in thessalonians two it's the you go from the motherly to the fatherly which is which is the security in God also, but it's also destiny. So it's like, I'm secure in God, but I have a destiny with, with the mom. It's I'm secure in God and I've got an identity. So you're going from identity to destiny and God and mature believers, Paul's writing to people who've committed their lives to Christ. He's basically saying in a loving way, we love you. We, you saw that when we were with you, Yeah. suck it up and let's move on. Yeah. And with Timothy, he actually tells him command rebuke, reproach. I mean, he, he, he tells them speak strongly to them and tell them to get away from their sin. So, I mean, that we, we got to pull all the Bible together. Yeah. You know, the old Testament and the fear of the Lord, new Testament, the grace through the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Pauline aspect Mm -hmm. of the opening up of what Christ was saying and doing was like, yeah, oh, that's true. He loves you in his great grace. Now let's do something. Let's go out and witness. Let's be ambassadors for Christ. Let's, let's, uh, as I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, let's, uh, knowing the terror of the Lord, we, we plead with men yeah. to come to Christ. Yeah. Another thing, yeah. Ashley, I was reading in Matthew <clears throat> was, um, how Jesus talked to the Pharisees. 
Yeah. Matthew 23 and 24, I think it is, is is astounding. Yeah. It is a a a uh, what what do you call it when you when you when you address someone up and down? I mean, it's called a uh a, you're you're uh, speaking to them the way I think you're <laughs> you're hitting every topic within them, you know. Yeah. You're, you're rebuking them. Yes. <clears throat> so this, you know, I, I hear today, you know, love is love, love is love. No, you know, in a lot of our culture now, the whole love is love thing. And, and, you know, we want to love like Jesus. Well, they, they haven't read about Jesus, I'm convinced. Yeah. Because Jesus defines love differently. You know, in the Hebrew he understanding, was there were several kinds of loves. Like Eros love, even in the LGBTQ community, when they talk about love, they're talking actually about something that is outside of boundaries of what sexual love is. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sexual love, Eros, sexual love in the Greek it's different than the agape love of God. <clears throat> agape love of God, we love everyone. We love LGBTQ. We love them. And, and yeah, yeah, but you don't, you love them, but you don't love their sin. Well, of course, we don't, we don't love any sin. I don't love sin in my own life. It's distressful. It brings death. And so you can define and say, we have boundaries with our love. You're talking about sexual love. Yeah. You have boundaries that were that have been fit to us by the word of God, by God himself, and we live within those boundaries. Mm. The the gay lifestyle, LGBTQ, I'm sorry, I'm 67 years old. I may not be using these terms properly, yes. but I can tell you the lifestyle that is represented in LGBTQ is outside the boundaries of what's in scripture mm -hmm. because it's based on sexual love, mm -hmm. not on agape love. Agape yeah. love, we love everybody. And yeah. we have patience with everyone, and we have great grace for everyone. Yeah, obviously with one another and our own selves. But when it comes to certain things, there are limitations, and the Bible lays them out. And don't be fooled mm -mm. if you continue to live in sin that is overt and against the Word of God. There are consequences for it. It's destructive. It's yeah. Part <laughs> of those consequences are eternal. Yeah. But even if you don't believe in the eternal. It is going to disturb your life here on earth, regardless of what sin it is. You smoke dope, you're a pothead, all of you, you that's all you do. You know, mm -hmm. and there's plenty of people that are famous that do that that we know about. I tell you, even that is has a destructive end to it. It it desocializes you. It can cause even the the power of marijuana today that is being sold. It's it's causing some real problems with people physically around the country as state by state, the doors yeah. being open to that. So we look at all these things and you go, well, is that sin? Well, anything that's going to separate you from God. Well, even, even we talked recently the about sin and weight. Yeah. And we even talked recently about if you referencing lot and his family, if you camp, if you set your camp up close to Sodom and Gomorrah, you'll get devoured by it. And it's kind of like yeah, that camp? too. Like why camp and why? Yeah, why camp near sin? Because because that's obviously going to be what you know draws you in. Is is that so? Yeah. So you know, I, I've ta I'm sorry. I, I don't want to feel like I'm going after sinners here. I'm not because I am a, a chief of one, like Paul said. Paul fallen short. But uh, it's interesting. We we've, we've got to watch that. You yeah. know, there's there's two there's two sides of the road we're on. One is the side of sin and and separation from god you know what's on the other side heaven religion <laughs> heaven's oh, in front of oh, us oh yes <laughs> the religion so jesus jesus i, I love jesus uh, for so many reasons matthew 23 you should tell me the answers ahead he of time deals, so he deals with not. religious people <laughs> actually i just read this out of uh Matt, it was matthew 23 i believe i'm trying to find it on here but anyway he addresses the Pharisees in front of a crowd of people, and he calls them uh, Pharisee hypocrites. Yeah. And I had to kind of laugh because one of the irritations about Donald Trump, a presidential candidate or this his year, nicknames. is that he makes up all these nicknames, you yeah. know, Crooked Hillary and all these other things mm -hmm. like that. I forget them, you know, but I, I kind of chuckled when I read this because he says it like five times. He says, Pharisee hypocrites. He's like making it the common name, Pharisee yeah. hypocrite, Pharisee hypocrite. He repeats it over and over. Is that a kind and loving thing to do? Maybe tell me, Ashley, tell me. Is it? No, but I, I, I thought. No? no. Jesus was no. not speaking a kind and loving thing. <laughs> well, he did. He, he even said himself that he wasn't. If you think I'm coming here to like 
bring the you know bring peace or to fight a war we'll come up with that's the sword not, yeah like <laughs> I, i'm i'm here for different reasons than what you think and so he's, so he's just, after the religious people also yeah yeah you know it's it's like you're you're either if you're not following jesus you're either a sinner or you're religious mm -hmm. and by the way he seems to approach the religious sinners as worse than the the regular sinners yeah. that are out there mm -hmm. in the world and so religious people, people who follow Christ, need to watch that you're not getting on the religious side. Well, I'm better than you are, and mm -hmm. I'm this or that, or I'm gifted, and I, God says I'm this. And we get all into that rather than just being a humble, quiet follower of Jesus yep. and allowing him to, his Holy Spirit, to shape you and mold you into the very image of Jesus. Yeah. So what do you think about Jesus calling him? Pharisee hypocrites. I just i i think i i think I'm excited to meet Jesus one day and see that. <laughs> I just he he has sounds like this, you're avoiding the question. He well he has this ability to call people out and and I think it's interesting that they they seem to be really on top of people who didn't honor them the way they were supposed to and so I think it's interesting that he had no fear at all to call them hypocrites to their face. Yeah. So I mean. If, let me take a minute. Just look at Matthew 23. Jesus speaking to the crowds and to his disciples. Uh, you've all read it this week. The teachers of the law of Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So he's starting to address the Pharisees. And he, he, he talks, I mean, they're right there. And he says, and everything they do is for people to see. This is what Jesus says. Yeah. Look at the Pharisees over here. Everything they do, show. you talk about awkward. Mm -hmm. they, may, they make their phylacteries, those little boxes they wear on their forehead to show that they put the word of God into their, into their mind. You know, it's like, it's like, look, see, I'm doing it uh, wide and the tassels on their garments long. It's all this stuff. And, and they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace. I get sarcastic when I read it. Cause I think that's what Jesus was doing and to be called rabbi by others. And he's going on and on. And he goes, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourself do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to enter. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over the land you, you see, and see to win a single comfort. And when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. That's Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, the lamb of God. <laughs> is also a lion yes. and he roars periodically. What is that? Let me ask you this. Oh, we'll, no. Maybe we'll kind of close on this. <laughs> How does that speak to the light? We're to be like Jesus. We're to be imitators of Christ. Yeah. Is that love? The way that he spoke to them? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I put the, uh, the I, tone to it, but I'm well, sure I would read it similar. the same way too. I read, I probably read it more with like a frustrated kind of like, yeah, I mean, how like do you say that in a normal way? Yeah. You waited, I think, I think it is. I think it is love. Right. It's, it's a different kind it's of love. It's a different kind of love because so, I think. Okay. Wait. So if we're saying that, yeah, then love may not be everything we think it is. Love is. No, is, I think it's a lot the more agape than what we love think. Yeah. <laughs> is something that's exercised out of the heart that actually can be a rebuking love at times. I don't want to be this be a license for people to get angry no. and yell at people. No. That's not that's not what it's about. No. But love does address here particularly because he is love. So when he's rebuking them, he is rebuking them from a place of love because that's who he is. Yeah, but we can do everything that he did. We can do everything so that he we did. We have to learn yes how to confront and exhort people. Mm -hmm. And you still have love in our heart toward yeah. them. Yeah, I don't think it gives people license to chew people out. And you got to find the balance, I think, of what it looks like to confront with love. I mean, but you make your disciples twice as much a child of hell as you are? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd love to That's hear from scary. everyone out there. <laughs> you know, the next verse, he says, woe to you blind guides. If it, I remember he's saying this in a pub. He's not confronting them in a in a side room somewhere. No, he's out in public. In public, and he's he's saying all this, and people go, I you know I hear people all the time saying, I want my love to be like Jesus. I want my love to be like. <laughs> well, this is love like Jesus. Sometimes he speaks to the things going on in the church and things that are going on in culture, and he speaks it as it is. In verse seventeen, he says, "You blind fools." 
Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by a gift on the altar, it's bound by the oath. It's like this whole thing that he's working through. He's been watching them. He's been observing them. And he's correcting them with the love of God. What do you think about the people that would respond? That doesn't sound like the Jesus I know. <sighs> Because well, that's sure. something I've heard there a, lot a lot of Jesus recently. I've heard that from people like, well, I've read the Bible and I read this portion of scripture and, and I'm realizing that some of the scriptures don't sound like the Jesus that I know. And it's like, well. Well, get ready because the you don't fully know Jesus. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if the Jesus the, that you if know the in Jesus scripture, in is coming, scripture doesn't sound coming. like the Jesus you know, then maybe perhaps you don't fully know Jesus. <laughs> Have you ever felt convicted by the holy spirit yes what did that feel like um when you feel convicted by the holy spirit like yeah, a what loving that, what correction like? like yeah what does it feel like when when you've done something wrong and well, and now you feeling like the holy spirit is saying hey this is wrong what's it feel like it just it feels it's not a trick question <laughs> <laughs> it feels horrible I'm trying to think. it feels horrible because i think like if you uh if we compare it to like a marriage relationship, if me and Jay have a moment where maybe I've not spoken kindly or something and he kind of comes to me and says, Hey, this wasn't great. How, how this happened. It feels horrible to hear that right. when, when you love someone so deeply and you care about someone and you're in a relationship with someone to hear that you've wronged them or you've done something that wasn't beneficial to the relationship. It feels horrible. So your heart is right. Yeah. You you have a commitment to Jay yeah. through marriage, so you your heart's tenderized by it, and you you feel bad, and you're yeah. like, yeah, I need to get this right. Yes, that's that's it. Postures my heart towards yes. reconciliation. The Bible says that he is near to those who have a broken and contrite heart. Yeah. So the middle of the road, you know, with Pharisees on the right, jokers on the left, <laughs> Pharisees <laughs> on the right, sinners on the left. Uh, as a believer, you've been a part of both those worlds. We've, we've experienced religion at its worst, probably. We've experienced sin at its worst. But we've come in the middle and said, I'm with Jesus, I'm following him, and the Holy Spirit is shaping you and molding you along the way. Mm. So we're not perfect, no. Nope. but we're being shaped by Jesus. And I, I just want to say, and you can say something final here in a minute, but you know, if anyone's out there listening to this and you, you're always living in condemnation, that is not the will of God for nope. you. Periodically, when you get convicted, don't be condemned by it. Just... Release it to the Lord. It's like a call to action. Yeah, just really say, you know what, <laughs> yeah. Holy Spirit, help me. I, I, yeah, I've got a, I've got a blind spot. I got a weakness yeah. in my life. I want to be holy. I want to walk in holiness before God. Well, and doesn't the power it, of the Holy Spirit will help you in your marriage relationship? Isn't it better to respond with, "Oh, I'm so <sighs> sorry. Like that is not how I want to be in our relationship." Instead of responding like, "You don't even know what you're talking about," you yeah. know, the <clears throat> response on the other end is completely different. And, you know, there were Pharisees in the New Testament that came to Jesus. Yeah. And so uh, some of them had tender hearts. Yeah. Not all of them were bad. Nope. But Jesus does paint them all in a certain category. Yeah. Because they were a culture and a sector that supposed to be uh, high and mighty God people, yet they were not. They were stealing from the poor. They were abusing the weak. Yeah. And he addressed it. And I'll, I'll say this. He'll, he'll address it. He'll address it today through believers that are really following Jesus. They will learn to help the poor. They will learn to oppose those who are oppressing the poor, mm -hmm. even in our culture with the abilities we have. So anyway, for me, that's all I got this week. I think I think we've probably raised more questions this week than yeah. we have answers. But I do want to know the fullness of Christ. I want to know him in in his in his ways of how do we confront things in our culture and yet still be loving and caring toward the individuals that we're speaking to them and how can we speak truth in our culture that questions everything about the words we use love truth all those things male female everything's being questioned right now it's a very difficult time for for believers but i'm telling you the holy spirit's been given to you as a helper cry out to the holy spirit say i need you show me what jesus would do in this situation. What do you think, Ash? 
I think that's a great way to end this episode. <laughs> I have a lot to ponder on now. <laughs> All right. You're going to come back loaded for bear next yes. week. Hey, we'll see you next week. I'm probably not going to be here next week. I think we may have uh, a guest, guest, a guest speaker yes. surprise. And yeah. we also have some surprise guest speakers coming next month. Oh, man. Who do we have, Ashley? We have Heidi Baker. What? Yes. Heidi she Baker. She has confirmed she's coming. Mama Heidi from Mama Mozambique Heidi. Yes. is and coming here to speak with us. Yes. And Brian Simmons, Brian lead Simmons. translator of the Passion Translation. Lead translator of the Passion. Wow. Who else would you want to have on a Bible podcast? I don't know. Maybe we'll maybe we'll pull in a Michael Culliano, sir. Yeah. Or Stephanie Gretzinger or something like that. We'll since see. we're going to be here, we'll we'll do our best. <laughs> yeah. But stay tuned. It's going to be a fun couple months here as we go deeper in the Word of God and watch our lives be shaped by yeah. Jesus. Have a great week. Bye.